Good morning. Good morning. And on this day, the words that we're going to be hearing and sharing are important. They, they resonate with the tragedy that is surrounding us, the violence. The man that is at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue that espouses the hatred and the violence. But it is in this place where we will comfort one another, where changes happened, where differences have always been made through our lives and through our actions. And so let these words ring within us and call us to action. So on this day, this summer morn, let us be one with these words from Langston Hughes and his poem, Luck. Sometimes a crumb falls from the table of joy. Sometimes a bone is flung. To some people, love is given. To others, only heaven. Let our hearts and our spirit prepare to soar and be filled with love as we gather today. Welcome to Fountain Street Church, a liberal church in the heart of Grand Rapids for 150 years. And welcome to this time of gathering among like-minded people who 
search for justice and peace and honor human dignity and diversity. Good to be here this morning. One little announcement, the search committee that's uh, looking for a new senior minister will be meeting in the social hall at 11 a.m., so right after the service. For the you search committee people, if you'd meet in the social hall, that would be appreciated. I'm also pleased to welcome Ginger Hensley, who's been a contributing member of Fountain Street for over 35 years. Quite a long history. She taught in the character school, fifth and sixth graders, which it influenced her quite dramatically, So, because she certainly is a character. <laughs> but she was a supervisor of the character school and worked in the office staff here at Fountain Street, was chair of the Choice Fund and other things. So welcome, Ginger. We are a diverse nation. And so many people gather this morning for <clears throat> what we call worship, a term that has always troubled me. What is it that we worship? High ideals and noble values that we need to have as part of our life's guiding star. And Ginger will share some of the guiding star principles and look forward to hearing from her. And she will now lead us in the responsive invocation. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the drake rests in his beauty and on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light for time I rest. Well, I joke that they had to hit the bottom of the barrel to ask me to speak today. So hang on to that thought. We're, we're going to have a nice little journey here. As David mentioned, I have been attending this amazing place for over 35 years, so it is an honor to address you all. Um, and it is something that I, that I take not with light, and, but, with, but with a sense of beauty. Part of what my time here has opened my heart to, thanks to Bruce Bodie, is poetry. And so, Kind of to honor Bruce, I've got our, our meditation, the words that will lead us, and they are from Mary Oliver. Little known fact about Bruce Bodie, he worked passionately, tirelessly, to get Mary Oliver to come speak here. And it, it I, you know, who wouldn't have wanted that? But, but she just, she was relentless with her nose, no, no, no. But through Bruce, I think Mary Oliver has been in these hallowed halls. And again, please hear Bruce, feel Bruce, see Bruce with these words. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to fall down into the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me. What else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? 
and gently as we enter this moment of meditation, let reflection guide you in the still beauty of comforting silence within your soul. Perhaps that's not what you're normally used to hearing on a Sunday service. But as David uh, mentioned, I, part of, one of my many joys here was that I was the character school supervisor for fifth and sixth grade and for also for Fountain Club. Part of what you had to do was engage a little bit in music. But it also is very reflective of what I feel about this church. This is a paradise for us. And as we go out into the streets, it's that just that song, that rendition just stirs my soul. And other things that stir one's soul is the social action, the social justice causes of what, what we as a congregation have done for the years way before me and what we will continue to do. So it is that I ask, in the spirit of giving, please open your generous heart and as a community of compassionate souls, we will now gratefully receive this morning's offering.
This morning's reading is from the Art of Happiness, a handbook for, li for living by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Howard C. Cutler, MD. I believe that the very purpose of our life is to seek happiness. That is clear. Whether one believes in this religion or that religion, we are all seeking something better in life. So, I think the very motion of our life is towards happiness. are made to bend in the wind to withstand the world as what it takes All that steel and stone a no match for the air my friend doesn't bend brakes what doesn't bend the brakes Vani DeFranco. There's no joke about that. One of the pure pleasures, um, little sidebar here, that uh, Fountain Club, on one of the many service trips that, at the time, Minister of Religious Education, Sue Cinnamon, was heading up the character school and took the kids, Fountain Club kids, to New York City, where they worked in Hell's Kitchen and soup kitchens and such. And Ani DeFranco was playing in Central Park. And my daughter, my oldest daughter, was on that trip. She could not stand my love of Ani, refused in good fashion, street fashion, to go to see Ani, but gave uh, Libby Bodie 20 bucks to get a T-shirt for me from Ani. So she kind of was there. So my path to Fountain Street Church is unique to me, but I'm sure that the Struggles of the journey are a shared, if not similar, experience for many of us. And in this journey, there, there was one odd twist for me. I fell in love. Now, not with a particular soul, but the collective souls of our church. The bricks, the Italian marble, the handcrafted details cut into this church. They found their way into my heart. And I was asked by Heather Palmer if I would like to speak on my work time here at Fountain Street Church for the summer ser sermon series. And to be honest, I did not immediately say yes. Not for the reasons that I have any kind of fear of public speaking. Don't get carried away thinking I do because I don't. But what did I have to say that was of consequence? So after a fashion, but really not all that long, I agreed. And then the challenges began to reach back into my memory. What did I feel? What did I learn? And what did I give some 25 years ago? The one memory that is never, 
ever left me and has never failed me is that first moment, that first day, the placing of my hand on that massive door handle, long brass pull, flinging open that massive door, and the rush, the smells, the invigorating energy of 24 Fountain Street. Now, my first Sunday of attending was in the fall, 1984. And it was with honest reluctance that I was here. But after all, it was the thing to do in West Michigan on a Sunday at 11 a.m. It was to attend church, right? So it was. Now, bringing my oldest daughter to character school, I was like, oh my God, what has happened to my non-conforming self? But upon flinging open that door, the rush of the people, the chatter, it felt to me not overwhelming, but it was an embracing invigoration. I felt home. And perhaps a bit lost too, because I really did resist this enveloping feeling of comfort. You see, my early church years were in my beloved southernmost Illinois. I don't know if you've detected, I might have just ever so slight of an accent. But I grew up on the Ohio River right across from Kentucky. Mind you, I have lived up here now for some 52 years, but that part of me still remains. But the other part that, that is there was the hypocritical, evangelical, and condemning churches. We had a little church just a couple of houses down. In this little town of about 900 people, there were probably no fewer than 12 churches. Yeah. My mother, bless her little heart, was a non-believer and did not hesitate to tell anybody, particularly the Southern Baptists, um, how she felt about them and their behavior. But the places where my neighbors attended church they handled snakes. They spoke in tongue. My God, that was so entertaining. But I was only allowed to attend that apostolic, evangelical, Pentecostal church two times a year. And that, that was the woman who watched me during the day while my mother was at work. I only got to go with Martha twice. It was something to behold. But it was, see, it was also hypocritical because they placed condemnation, judgment, and the such, such every Wednesday and Saturday, and it was on full display. Those were not values that were encouraged or incorporated into my family, thankfully, but that didn't stop me from the most insincere form of flattery by imitation. My little six-year-old self loved to jump up top of a covered well pit. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they're about this tall, and I would jump up there and I had my white Bible in my hand, and I had to be up there, and I had to reach. And I would just go on. I didn't even have, I didn't have an audience. I didn't care. I would just get up there and just carry on. And then sometimes Mama would have to come get me and get me off of there and say, come on, it's time for supper, which it really wasn't, but it was just to settle me down a little bit. But I loved to preach from up there. But I was actually probably making a bit of fun of them and not realizing it. So it was through this hesitancy that I have that was formed at a very early age to be a member of a faith community. And that, I think, was well placed. Get it? Well placed? Okay. Remember, I worked with Jim Culver. <laughs> Thank you, life experiences. You see, but this place, it filled my soul and I wanted more. I wanted to give more. So it was perhaps to excuse myself from the sermons in the sanctuary, or perhaps even better yet, to fulfill a desire that I had in my heart to give more. So I wanted to surrender a part of my heart, so I volunteered as a teacher with our character schools, first in grades three, then first and second grade, and then in fifth and sixth grade. I loved it. The care and the dedication of our Minister of Education, Sue Cinnamon. And yes, we actually did have a female in an administrative lead role back then. 
it's time to get back to that, folks. Search committee, talking to you. <laughs> and I'm adamant about that. But at least I digress. But we also had an incredible group of character school supervisors that helped formulate the character school teachers. Uh, Sharon Collins, Edith Switek, Maggie Rowe, Judy Mraz. These women, their passion and the care for our young people just blew me away. But it was this deepening, living a life of happiness, guidance, giving, and love that further affirmed my love affair with this place. Now, you see, I'm slightly chatty. And when I would come in for our meetings and trainings and stuff, I had contact with the office staff. So as a character school volunteer, I would walk past the office and I would wave to them, oftentimes pop in and say hello. Because you see, they, they also had this energy that I wanted more of. I wanted more of that. So perhaps it was in this chatty way, I, I must have done a few things right. Because I was approached by Sue to consider becoming a character school supervisor of the fifth and sixth grades. And I was so honored, holy cow. But um, I did wonder exactly what would this entail. Well, Sue said, well, we would use current curriculum and writing, you would have to maybe write new units of study, incorporating the seven senses of intelligence, and there would be training for the, the teachers, for the 50 to 60 fifth and sixth graders that we have. And my God, we were a vibrant community back then. Sue did leave out a couple of vital parts here, though. Sue being Sue. She failed to mention the church sleepovers, the overnight camping trips, the service projects, coordinating additional experiences in the fun of giving. Because you see, social justice, giving back to our community outside the walls of 24 Fountain, that was an integral part woven into our religious education experiences. We gave, and that resonated with me. But it was a joyous six plus years. And then I also had two glorious years with Fountain Club and Patty Johnson. And she was there as a guidepost and a sounding board. High schoolers are different, and note that I said I only gave two years. <laughs> but it was through this job that led to my next job. So here I'm going to let you, if, if you're familiar with the Dolly Parton song, Nine to Five, kind of let that music, but not the lyrics, go through your mind, because the lyrics have nothing to do with my experiences. Nothing at all. So it was early on a Tuesday morning, about 11.30 a.m., which technically isn't early. But Joanne Earl and Lisa Hill asked if I had a few minutes to chat with them. And I'm thinking, oh, good God, what ultimate violation have I committed? So you see, Joanne was all the things, all the qualities that you would want to be. She was nicknamed Mother Superior as she ran Fountain Street Church. And she ran this place with a fierce devotional passion. But thank you, Jesus, she did spare the rod. So they ushered me into our senior minister at the time, who was David Rankin, into his office, closed the door behind me. And upon hearing that, that door latch, I did feel a tad faint. But Joanne's grace and her smile and her overall aura provided a lumping, loving comfort and the words You've done nothing wrong. <laughs> well, that elicited a slight chuckle, and my breathing was restored at a rate the American Lung Association of, of life-sustaining quality. <laughs> the purpose of this meeting was to discuss my interest in joining the office staff, as Joanne was soonish to retire, and Lisa Hill would assume Joanne's role, and then I would assume Lisa's. Oh, my God. Me? Me, a church secretary? Oh, <laughs> uh, let me tell you, this, that was not ever in my work plan of life, ever. But as they described the tasks, answer the phone, greet those as they came entering the office, typing, uh-oh, not another, that's not a strong suit for me, proofreading, prep for member events, 
preparing and compiling the annual report, which was incredibly important. Well, they appealed to me. But more so, it was being involved in the underbelly of the workings of 24 Fountain. So upon Joanne's suggestion, I took a couple of days to ponder, was this right for me? Was this right for my family? Now, to be honest, I really, again, did not need all those days to ponder because I knew I was home. I knew I belonged, and my love affair to serve 24 Fountain was once again deepened and my soul fulfilled. I had an office job. <laughs> I was all grown up. I couldn't really, though. You know, here were the hesitations because my closet didn't hold the proper clothes. But dang, let me tell you what, this girl, this woman, this feminist, I can answer a phone with some style. <laughs> Good morning, thank you for calling Fountain Street Church. This is Ginger, how may I help you? That stayed with me to this day at my current workplace. Good morning, thank you for calling Lake Town Golf and Conference Center. This is Ginger, how may I help you? It stayed with me. Home is always with me. My love affair with this place has never left me. It is current. It is life-sustaining. Phone style. Thank you, Joanne Earl. The on-the-job training with Joanne and Lisa was really Life Skills 101. Explain with clarity. Expect the best. Give the most. Job jar. What the heck is a job jar? But we'll get back to that one. Be authentic with your smiles. Be honest. If you don't know, for God's sake, ask. Don't make repeated mistakes. Laugh. Listen with a gentle heart, but be authoritative in your answers. Keep your number two pencil sharp. And remember, the Women's Association is the backbone of 24 Fountain. I learned so much from Joanne, but let me backtrack to the job jar. So you see, one afternoon I'd let her know that I was all caught up with my task and if was there anything that she would like for me to do. So she suggested I check the job jar, which in all honesty she previously had referenced. So she left the office, was off doing some other things, and I began the hunt. Where was this said job jar? So I'm searching high and low, opening the cupboards, opening the drawers, looking, looking, looking. I start mumbling to myself because yet again, remember, I am a chatty person. And I keep doing this, keep opening, looking, and, and I can't find this job jar. Gail McConnell, who also worked in the office at the time, because I'm kind of banging and clattering over in her end, she was becoming slightly annoyed with my mumbling and repeated opening and closing of the cupboards, she asked, what, what are you looking for? The job jar. The what? That's what she asked. She repeated, the what? And a little bit louder, a little bit more elongated, I said, the job jar. And oddly, she burst out laughing, like real laughing, gut-busting laughing. Well, that caught Vera's ear. Vera Morris also worked at Fountain Street Church, and she was Sue Cinnamon's secretary. So want never to miss a good laugh, Vera entered and asked what's so funny. And good grief, Gail couldn't even give her an answer. She was laughing so. So I confident replied, I'm looking for the job jar to catch up on things. And then Vera asked, what? I said, the job jar, I replied. And then to, Vera too burst out laughing at me. So with no help from either of them, I was left to wonder what the heck was so funny about a job jar. Left that day, still not finding the job jar. Next morning, we're all in, and I found out that the job jar was not really a physical thing, because I was looking for like a glass jar with little slips of paper in there, because that's what I had prepared when Joanne said put things in your job jar. I had little slips of paper that I was supposed to put in there. But it's really just more of a mental list that one keeps. To this day, again, I also have a job jar, but mine is written down on a computer. So every time I add to it, I think of those women, and they make me chuckle. So yes, on occasion at our uh, weekly meetings, they would bring this up when we were going over things that we needed to do for the church. What might we do? We would joke. 
let's add that to the job jar. We would laugh. The ministers, David, Bruce, Jim Culver, Sue Cinnamon, would all look like, oh my God, what the hell's going on with these women? They're losing it, but inside joke, sorry folks. So you see, another lesson that I learned was to say no thank you and to stand firm if you don't like things like, say, I don't know, tuna noodle, cas tuna, tuna noodle casserole or cherry pie. At our weekly staff meetings, Joanne would prepare these beautiful luncheons. She was an excellent cook. She poured over Gourmet Magazine and, and Bon Appetit. And you see, she did a little bit more than just look at the pretty pictures and tear out recipes. She actually cooked. So prior to one such meeting, she was heating up the hot dish. And good God, my nose got the aroma. And I had that faint feeling again. Was it? Could it be? No, no, it wasn't. Was my nose playing tricks on me? And as I entered the boardroom, and this is where in my brain I heard the dramatic music, dun, 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 it was tuna noodle casserole, which there is no way I'm eating that. <laughs> and I look, and if that wasn't bad enough that my nose was hit with these senses, there it was. There it was right there, smack dab in the middle, slightly to my left within easy eye shot, cherry pie. Now, I love pie, don't get me wrong. I'm a good little Southern girl. I love me some pie except cherry pie. And then I thought, oh my God, how am I gonna survive this meeting? So politely, you know, I dished myself a small portion and then I performed this most beautiful dance of fork and food, slow dancing on my plate. I kind of keep doing that. Every time someone says something, I attentively place my fork down and look up at them, take a polite sip of water, then resume the dance. I look up, Joanne sat at the head of the table, where Mother Superior should sit, and our eyes locked. And she, I knew, noticed that there was no fork to mouth action happening with me. So to save a little bit of face, I ate the back part of the crust, the most crust, where there's very little cherry pie filling. But there was a little bit, and I think I made an ugly face when that cherry pie, I did not eat any tuna noodle casserole, for the record. <laughs> I, I just couldn't. But when that cherry pie hit my tongue, I know I made ugly face. Why? Why did I have to have that little bite? So Joanne asked me, hey, Ginger, would you help me clear today? I don't ever remember her asking anybody to clear. And she said to me, well, I, I noticed you didn't eat much. So I began to stammer, and she said, if there's something you don't like, let me know. I'll make sure to have something for you. Now, if that's not love, I don't know what is. There were no hurt feelings, and it was encouraged here, there, all of this to be oneself. I love this place, then and now. But what I really loved about it was when others had cherry pie, I got an ice cream sundae and homemade cookies from Miss Earl. Yes, I did. Deliver yourself fully to your workday experience with confidence. You were loved, and you will be supported fully, even when you make those horrific mistakes forever. Now, as I mentioned previously, proofreading was a big part back then of what we had to do in the office. We prepared the chimes. We had all of the announcements and all of the stuff that the ministers and whoever was speaking, if it was a guest speaker, what they were providing. So you had to have it exact word for word. So like we have the, the bulletin now, that was all proofread, sent out, and it was sent out to thousands of people by the US mail. We also had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them printed for in-house. So we had the order of service, announcements, cal calendar of, of events for the week, and quarterly we would list members who had passed, those who had died, in memoriam. So for this particular issue of the chimes, I was asked to type up the list of those who had died. 
and it seems very simple, but it was an honor to be entrusted with this very, very important info that we had to rely, relay to the congregation with accuracy. So I handed the info to Gail. She included it in the chimes. We proofread the issue, caught and made corrections. So I thought, Monday morning, I walk into the office, da, 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 da. And there stands Joanne, the copy of the chimes in her hand. She had a copy of the bulletin. I don't know that I got a good morning right away. She's asked me, did you compile the list of the deceased members? And suddenly it felt as if I was in a police interrogation room. The desk disappeared. Everything was focused. That woman had eyes locked on me. It felt as if there was either a spotlight or her piercing gaze cutting into my heart at that moment. I don't know which it was, but I answered with confidence. Yes. Did you and Gail proofread this from your copy? But before I answered yes, Joanne handed me the chimes, circled in red, was that member's name. And as I looked at the paper, she said, they are not deceased. <laughs> there was a naughty word that went through my head, let me tell you. I felt sick. And as I looked up with kindness in her eyes, she said, this won't happen again, will it? It did not. I did as part of the uh, proper, I, I'm not going to say punishment, but it was a corrective action to ensure that it wouldn't happen again. I did reach out to the family, um, but prior to that, one of, this, one of the ministerial staff had reached out and let them know that I would be calling to kind of, I think, help pave the way. Awkward, let's just say real awkward. Well, the years I spent with Lisa as administrator were filled with similar adventures and continued rigor and guidance of the church and staff always with laugh, laughter, and respect. What did Lisa bring to Fountain Street? She helped us modernize. See, we used to have typewriters in there and correction fluid. And then we got fancy with those little strips that you would put in. Let me tell you what, we bought them in bulk when I joined that office staff. I alone am responsible for driving up the office costs. As I couldn't type for Jack, let me tell you. I, Jack Bowers or anybody, it was a little joke again. Um, but we got, we got modernized, we got computers. I will tell you, thank you Rick Rabe, he helped us get modernized. There was a time that the server went down, possibly it got unplugged accidentally because we felt it was making a noise, we didn't realize it, we moved it and it went unplugged and we had a little collapse of the system. There was a little bit of laughter. We were not technologically savvy, but boy, did we come up to speed real quick. The other thing that Lisa brought and continued to grow was social justice action. So we had the Pastors Fund A, Pastors Fund B. And part of that was deep involvement with the Choice Fund. So after years, several years, Lisa Hill moved on to explore writing and traveling and I was asked to become the administrator of Fountain Street Church. So it was with no hesitancy, as I was honored to grow and given more time and direction this place that I so dearly loved. I mean, who would not want to have weekly meetings with David Rankin, who was our senior minister at the time, coordinated activities, important activities like golf league with Bruce Bodie. And I gotta tell you, these were some of my personal best times, not on the golf course. Bruce was a really good golfer and a really good bowler. He had three bowling balls. He would show up when we would do bowling with the kids with three balls. Like apparently you have one if you're trying to bowl straight, and then if you want to curve the balls to have them go in and hit various pins, you have different balls. I thought he was being a little showy. I said, oh, little Mr. Christian Reformed, look at you being all braggadocious there. The rest of us used to just use the balls that we get off the rack. But he would let the kids throw his balls. That was, I thought that was pretty amazing to him. So these guys, though, you know, and the guys, when I say guys, it also, I mean, also including Sue Cinnamon in this, they, they were intellectually superior to me, no doubt. 
They were better read. They might use their words a little bit better, but they were in our discussions. Never, ever was I snubbed with my lesser knowledge or my sometimes annoyingly inquisitive mind. As I mentioned, I got to have weekly meetings with David. So after our Tuesday staff meetings, I, we would go into his office, close the door, and we talked about all the important stuff. He'd ask me, Ginger, what's the state of the church? And I started the first couple times to go on and on and on and on. He said, all I need to know, is it okay? I trust you. You know what to do. Joanne and Lisa have shown you. Okay. So we talked about the important stuff, ourselves outside the walls of 24 Fountain Street. The care of your family and self is not assumed here, but it's given. And one's heart becomes fuller, more giving, and stronger directionally. And that's good, not only for our church family, but it was good for my family. But we really did chat about the important stuff, movies, music, basketball, literature, philosophy, our shared upbringing in rural poor mining communities, and I'm not sure if I mentioned basketball. We love basketball. One conversation that I've never forgotten was about criminal justice. David asked me, and, and some of you here remember David and the way in which he would deliver sermons and have talks with you. And he would oftentimes when he didn't want you to really say anything, when he wanted it to resonate in with you, he would stop, tip his head a little, and shake it just about three or four times, and have a little smirk on his face. So one of the questions that we had that we were posing was that if a person steals because they're hungry, is it wrong that they stole? Should they be incarcerated? Are their actions wrong? What was society's role in ensuring no one goes hungry? I've never forgotten that conversation. That forever changed my feelings, my views on death penalty, what's proper incarceration. It, it just I, I can't even explain to you how deeply that touched my soul. He never really expressed to me other than I started to go and he said, before you answer, think. Is it wrong to care for your family? Now, not all of the staff um, were attending members, contributing members of Fountain Street Church, so we, we brought different perspectives to it. One of my great duties volunteer duties that I, I never relinquished was with our Nova Choir. And I, I served as choir mom. I also previously, the connection that I had to Ars Nova was that I was Jim Culver's secretary. And he and I got along famously. We loved, 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 loved to share puns. We felt that they were a higher form of intelligence. The rest of the staff did not agree. We would think, well, they're just jealous because they can't keep up with us. And he and I were like, boom, 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 boom. That was fun. You see, my children were also involved in choir, so it was an opportunity to, yet again, weave more deeply the ties that bind. But our Snova was more than a church choir. They participated in competitions, and they were amazing. We coordinated poinsettia sales to help offset the cost of these trips. There was one time that Jim forgot to reserve buses for one of the trips. These trips occurred during tulip time. I don't know if you're familiar with tulip time. There are no buses available in Wisconsin, Northern Illinois, North, is it Northwestern Indiana. And I went down and I said, here is a check. I need a bus. We're leaving next week. We got a bus. He was a little forgetful. He was an artist, you know, that was okay. He had me. But we coordinated these trips, and I gotta tell you, one of our chaperones is here. There was Jan Lundane, Wendy Capoca, Connie Winter Troutwine. We had our hands full. No doubt we had our hands full 
watching over these children, grades 6 through 12, all traveling together in a bus. Now, they might have done things. Some of the older kids, the younger kids, were very well behaved. But there was, uh, on one of the trips, a glass stairwell. And I'm walking out of the parking lot. I look up, and I see two young women mooning. Yeah, they're kids. Come on, that's what kids do. So I waited, told them at the appropriate time, perhaps we don't ever want to do that again. Um, that I, was I going to tell their parents, no, you're going to have to deal with me instead. Another time when we were there, we, we had a handful of naughty, naughty kids. They were troublesome. So Wendy and Connie suggested that we sit out in the hallway all night long. And remember this? Monitor the hallway. There's no way in hell I am giving up my sleep to sit out in the hallway. So what we did, we concocted an idea. We told the kids that if they lost their room key, the hotel was going to charge each of them 50 bucks a night. So, because, you know, who's got a lot of money? So I said, I said, I will be the bad person. They're used to me being the evil one. You either give me all your money, because I also rode in the back of the bus with the older kids, so I knew how much money they had at every stop for snacks and stuff. I said, you either give me all your money or your room key. So we took their room key so that they couldn't sneak out at night and get back in, unless they would turn the deadbolt. We just simply had a couple times, patrol the hall, open the door, flip the deadbolt, close the door, they were done. They knew we were on to them. We were so brilliant on that. We out MacGyvered them, that's what we did. So Fountain Street Church offered these young people to push themselves, to travel, to test unsteady waters. They gave them patience and to support one another. The olders took care of the youngers, and the youngers taught the olders some amazing life lessons, Long t lifelong friendships. Now, as office staff, we enjoyed several things. We enjoyed in-house happy hour. Yes, we did. Holy water, right? We also enjoyed dinners off-site, shared the joys and frustrations of our home lives, and supported one another. Because it wasn't just about completing the tasks but we also whistled while we work. And at times we uttered disdain a little bit, some words, but we cared for one another. Compassion for our congregation, the greater community beyond the walls, while some trumpeted the virtues of QVC, I'm not gonna say Gail and Vera, but I guess I just did. We bask in being recipients of the joys of holiday baking, work ethics that are beyond admirable, and all to ensure that the daily work a Fountain Street Church, 24 Fountain, was done. And a caring community was yet extended. These aren't just memories for me. This was a labor of love. So some of you might have noticed this little thing right down here. This, this is a turtle that was in David Rankin's office. And it was on our, I get emotional on this. I've had this on his retirement, and he gave this to me. And we sat down, and we're in his office. He whirled around, and he said, I've got something for you. And he handed this to me, and he said to me, and these words have always, always stayed in my heart. He said, Ginger, this, this turtle is your totem. And I'm like, oh my God, here we go, getting philosophical. Not out of the norm for David. But the words were, go slowly. Remember to take your time to retreat. Be steady and strong. The race is yours. Go in love. Blessed be.
We are a people of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. Use the power of these words to give direction, truth, life, and love to all. And may these words be your guiding mantra this week in all the hours, all the days, and all the weeks that follow. Blessed be. You are welcome. As a reminder, all of you are invited to participate with the uh, search committee today. So they invite you to go into the social hall. Correct, Heather? Thank you. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>